Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Julie McCrossan and it's my great pleasure to welcome everybody in this room in, uh, at the University of Technology, Sydney, but also 40 people at different locations, including Western Australia and the Northern Territory who are with us. Give them a clap so that they know there are humans in the room. I'll just do a couple of, say a couple of things before uh, I ask uh, Uncle Alan Madden to uh, formally open us with a welcome to country. But I want to let you know that you're at the Health and Justice and Ageing Symposium, that our hosts are Health Justice Australia, the Older Persons Advocacy Network, and the University of Technology Sydney, where we're standing now, the Law Health Justice Research Centre uh, in the Faculty of Law. I've also been informed it's, it's World Down Syndrome Day, so I just want to acknowledge uh, that as well. Our purpose in a nutshell today is that we're going to try and identify, you know, the two or three most significant systemic factors that drive and underpin vulnerability for older Australians. And obviously we're looking especially at this issue of health and access to justice. And I think most importantly, we want to identify opportunities for collaboration across health and justice that uh, will provide empowerment and autonomy to older people. And we've got a, a whole range of people who are already doing things in the room. Uh, and by the end of the day, uh, we want to be talking about what more needs to be done. So it's not hit and miss or piecemeal, but that when us in the room, what, 10, 15 years for some of us? <laughs> could be quicker, could be now, says Kay Patterson, that's because of a role. Um, that, you know, that we can feel safe uh, that there are systems in place that if we need help uh, to get access to health care and to exercise our legal rights, uh, and just in case our family aren't on the job or are the problem, we'll get help. Is that it in a nutshell? I think so. So we want to share inspiring examples of good work. And the format is going to be interviews, uh, panel discussion, and as some of you will have seen me do before, I will run around the room with a cordless handheld mic, uh, getting your questions and comments and never letting go of the microphone. Um, and th most thrilling of all, in a way, I, I'm prepared to say, is the presence of Assistant Professor Elizabeth Tobin Tyler, who's come all the way from the United States. Uh, and you'll see that her research work and her teaching work and her experience in this area is absolutely spot on and is uh, going to assist us mightily. Lucky Door Prizes will be issued immediately after the break. And if you're not back at the scheduled time and your number comes up, it's redrawn. In the game, we call it a behaviour management program. Are you with me? <laughs> and we've got a fantastic opportunity worth hundreds of dollars to go to a conference on health and justice. But just to warm it up a bit, I've also got a couple of bottles of red wine. <laughs> now, just for our people uh, before we start that who are watching uh, via the internet, there is a question bar in your events app. Ask questions and they'll come to me via a human being. And if you have any problems, go to the question bar for your live stream moderator. And I'll give you my mobile in a minute in case none of that works and you need to ring me directly. And so what I'd like to do now is to formally begin by asking uh, Uncle Alan Madden from the Metropolitan Aboriginal Local Land Council, Gadigal Elder, uh, to begin proceedings. Please make him welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Once again, my name is Alan Madden, Gadigal Elder. For my first song... <laughs> nah. That's at the after party later. Uh, two apologies for the terrible weather we're having outside at the moment. Sorry. <laughs> and I've been able to welcome you to my country and my language, as Wolf have been to talk our language a long time ago. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as we've all welcomed the countries, first and foremost, as always, to acknowledge our Aboriginal elders, all elders, past and present, and pay my respects to all our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters. From whatever Aboriginal or island nation you may have come from, welcome to Just as here today, a very warm and sincere welcome to you to Gadigal. No matter where you've come from, whether it be across the seas, across the state, or across town, once again, a very warm and sincere 
sincere welcome to you to Gadigal. And as I've mentioned many times before, was, is, and always will be Aboriginal land. Only three things shorter than that, coming, taxation and going. It's always an honour and pleasure to welcome one and all to Gadigal. Gadigal is one of 29 clans of the Eora Nation. The Eora Nation is bounded by nature's own. The Hawkesbury River to the north. The mobs up that way call it the Darkenjung. The Pean to the west, the Derebin. And George's River to the south, Kaime. And in between those three mighty rivers is the Eora Nation. And in that nation there are 29 clans. And the clan's land we're on today is Gadigal. On behalf of members of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council and of the Gadigal mob, once again, a very warm and sincere welcome to you to Gadigal. There's an old saying out there, and I think it's very appropriate for you mob here today. You follow us heard it a thousand times before. They say, where there's a will, there's relatives. And you'll be talking about some of us old fellas, and I see a few of my mob here, the old grey-head mob. <laughs> but always remember, there's been many a good tune being played in the old fiddle. You've got to think about that, you fellas. <laughs> but once again, on behalf of Land Council and of the Gadigal mob, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, well, I want to begin. We've got an incredibly disparate group of people here uh, from all manner of backgrounds, and so I thought it's always good to have the people who've organised the event explain to us what the purpose is. So if I could invite Tessa Boyd-Kane to join me and also Craig Gear, uh, and also Associate Professor Nola Rees. And if you could sort of jiggle around me on the stage, because I'd like to be straight in front of the cameras. It's a normal position to be in. And just crowd close to me, Craig, don't be afraid. Physical contact is good. Um, so what we have here are our three organisers, and uh, I, I'm going to ask them, each of them what they see as the fundamental purpose and what they're hoping to get out of the day. Also, there's been some announce announcements from the Attorney General, and I thought we'll have a quick briefing on that because they're relevant to what we're doing here. And then, uh, before we invite our keynote speaker from the United States, we're going to hear two or three examples of uh, collaborative work to address health and justice needs that are already happening in Australia to sort of illustrate what it's about. So, Tessa Boyd Kane, do you want to explain? You're the CEO of Health Justice Australia. In a nutshell, what is that? Health Justice Australia is a national charity and centre of excellence supporting health justice partnerships, which are collaborations that embed legal help into healthcare teams and settings. So really trying to address some of the social problems, the underlying needs in people's lives that are driving poor health or are barriers to, poor, to good health. Now, can you speak up? Can you see how my voice sounds a lot louder? This is all, my whole day is just microphone technique. Um, so if, if you can just speak up a little bit, guys, it just booms it out a bit more. Um, what do you want these people to get out of today? What's its fundamental purpose? Look, we've been watching the work towards addressing elder abuse and the really strong advocacy from communities and community organisations to support a national plan to address elder abuse, similarly in the space around aged care with the Royal Commission. And that has been really tremendous work and many people in this room have been critical in laying that foundation. But in between those acute needs, we're seeing a really significant set of questions starting to emerge among the services we work with, mostly health and legal services, about what are the needs of the ageing population and how are those services preparing for it. And given what we know about the demographic shift in Australia, about the shift that is coming down the pipeline in terms of our ageing population, we want to work with services and with policymakers and funders to make sure that our services are prepared to meet the needs of that ageing population. So for us, this is a chance to hear from people in the room about where are they already recognising those challenges and most ideally to forge collaboration across all of the experts in the room, community, community organisations, government and others, to lay the foundations for supporting people to age with health, with justice and with dignity. 
So if I came back in five years, if this uh, catalyst for action had worked, what, what, what would be happening more in Australia that isn't happening now? I think we'd have a strong voice from people with lived experience around what are some of the challenges, what are some of their vulnerabilities and how are they addressing those challenges. And we'd have a really effective service infrastructure right across our health, legal and human services landscape to back that in, in terms of making sure that where people have needs are facing vulnerabilities, that they've got the supports they need to address those. Look, I'll just wiggle over here for a second. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. I'm Nola Rees. I'm an Associate Professor with the Faculty Law at UTS. And part of the purpose of today for you and work that you're keen on is what Tess has just referred to as giving a voice to older people themselves. So can you tell us what you see as the purpose of the day, but particularly that issue of, of giving a voice to older people themselves? Yes, well, so I'm here wearing two hats. So I'm a researcher in health uh, uh, law and ageing and also an educator of the next generation. And I think it's really important in both those aspects, both in doing research that older people have a key involvement in that, and that for students studying whether in health disciplines or law disciplines, that they, they actually learn something from older people. So I invite older people into my elder law classroom to share their experiences. Do you, and where do you find those people? Like, how do you do that? Yeah, that's a good question. So a number of my colleagues and other faculty, say in the Faculty of Health, for their projects, they develop advisory committees. So they have older people on a committee advising them. So it's not just the researchers saying, we think we know what the problems are. And through connecting with them and having our cross-faculty connections, I can get some of those people to come into my law classroom and share their experiences. So from, a league, from your perspective, what are you, is the purpose of today and what's got to happen for it to have been worthwhile? Well, one thing I would like to hear about is ageism. To me, that seems to be a root cause as one of the systemic drivers of vulnerability. So how can we identify ageist practices and beliefs and help to stamp that out. Uh, we've talked about interprofessional collaboration. There's always this great talk of joining up services. So I would love to hear practical examples of how people are doing that. Hand up if you think you're involved in, in a collaboration uh, that goes to people's health and legal rights. Can you just put it in your hand? Fantastic, great. So we'll, get, we'll make sure we get examples across the room. Is there anything else you'd like to say in terms of what you're hoping for today? Yes, I once read a statement that older people have two kinds of problems, the problems professionals think they have and the problems they actually have. So I'm really keen to hear from older people in the room, older pe people who may be participating online to share their experiences, but also professionals have an important role in sharing stories of the clients they've worked with. Are we defining older? I'm 64. This hair's grey. It costs me about 140 every six weeks. <laughs> so, you know, do we have a definition of old? Well, there certainly is. There are technical definitions, and they're set at age brackets above 60, above 70. I mean, one of the things that we have been looking at is that the experience of ageing differs across the community. So certainly we work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controlled organisations for whom issues around ageing manifest very differently. And that's, again, part of what we're trying to draw out in this discussion. Okay, well, thank you. Now, let's meet you. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. So uh, my name's Craig Gear. I'm the CEO of the Older Persons Advocacy Network. So our organisations and our nine members provide uh, individual advocacy support, information and education to older people and their families around the aged care system and how to get the best out of the aged care system. And are you state-based or national? We're national. We've got nine members, two, uh, one in each state and territory and two in the Northern Territory. So how would you sum up the purpose of today? What do you want them to get out of it and do next? So it's interesting with the national plan, and we, we talked about this. So explain the national plan. There's a, a national plan to respond to the abuse of older Australians. So in a nutshell, what's that and where did it come from? So it's been, I suppose, championed by community sector, by government for quite a while. Uh, it was about a year ago at the fifth National Elder Abuse Conference and we were calling for a national plan. The government came forward and said they were going to develop it. It came out this, this week, last week. Um, and it gives a bit of a roadmap of where we need to go to. It's a starting point and there's more work to do. We want to see sort of more... Uh, work in rural and remote. We've been talking about this morning with some of our people. and uh, But it, it starts to look and, uh, across government and across, across states and territories of what really needs to happen to stamp out elder abuse. 
So that's particularly focused on elder abuse, but you want this session to be more than just prevention and response. Would you comment on that? Yeah, so um, this is a great opportunity for a different parts of the sector to all come together to look at how we all play a role in in supporting and, I suppose, identifying vulnerabilities and then how do we actually support people to stand up for themselves as they get older. I mean, ageing is about 40 years and uh, there's a long time there for us to actually uh, keep our rights, stand up for our rights and actually um, help people to make decisions for themselves all that, uh, through that time. Well, and where do you get the figure 40 years from? Oh, we just know that we're, people are ageing. Um, and so you're thinking like from retirement at around 65 till death, is that what you're basically... Absolutely, and that's about half a life. So long time to go, yep. So what happened with the Attorney General yesterday? And can you give just enough context so that anyone who's not familiar with the history of it uh, understands what's going on? Sure. So um, last year, the Commonwealth Government made a commitment of around $22 million towards establishing a national plan to address elder abuse. Really significant funding. And again, congratulations to the phenomenal advocacy from communities and community organisations to secure that. What happened this week was the next stage in that plan, which was um, clarity about a number of the commitments that were made. So funding for service trials, trials of three different service models, um, health justice partnerships, embedding lawyers in healthcare teams and and settings, mediation services, working with families around issues of elder abuse, and advocacy services reflecting the issues that Craig was talking about in terms of particularly institutional settings. That was only one part of the announcement. There was also commitments to develop a knowledge hub, ideally a one-stop shop for information and access to resources around the needs and responses to elder abuse, and also um, a number of prevalence studies that have been commissioned to help us really understand what does, pre what does elder abuse look like and where is it prevalent in the community. So, so some other elements around it, but that's really the gist of it. And what's the relevance of that, those announcements this week and that allocation of funding and those priorities and what we're doing today? Are they exactly the same or is there a difference? That's a... Good question, Julie. I, th I think there's overlap. I think we've had a really strong focus on acute need and that's been framed in terms of elder abuse and what's happening in, in aged care particularly. But many of the services in those trial sites and beyond them are working at n need in lots of um, ways. They're looking at prevention and early intervention as well as responsiveness. And so part of the question is, what do we mean when we talk about elder abuse? Is that the catchphrase for vulnerability broadly? Not everyone who's ageing is vulnerable to health and legal needs, but there are particular vulner vulnerabilities and to social needs. So I think part of the opportunity now, through that national plan and beyond, is to get some clarity about what are those needs, who is vulnerable and how, and how can we best support them. Look, my instinct is to go to examples from the floor. Is there anything anyone else would like to say before I do that? Have I missed something or do you feel, you've, do you, feel you have a sense of why we're here? I, I need a little bit more audio response. <laughs> well, look, would you give them all a round of applause, please? <laughs> now, if it's OK with the camera, I'm just going to go to the floor. If, does that bother you? Or do, yep, it, that's OK, because I, don't, I just want to come down here and I, I want to do something I would love to do, which was invite a social worker and a solicitor to approach me. Yvonne Lepainen is a solicitor, Barbara Lee is a social worker, and they're both working at St Vincent's in Sydney. Would you give them a round of applause as, as they come to me? <laughs> and is Teresa in the room? I just... No, thank you. It's, um, do you want to come either side of me, guys? Oh, yes, you are. Good, I'll be one sec. Oh, I'm getting two social workers. The only, let's, let's go up in the air. It'll make it easier for the camera. It'll come up. The only thing better than one social worker is two. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not being facetious. I, I'm going to try all through this afternoon to not make reference to my recently late mother and my 25 years of engaging with all the issues we hear about today. But I can tell you, social workers are great. Who are the social workers? I am one. Do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Barbara Lee. I'm one of the senior social workers at St Vincent's in the Transitional Aged Care Program. I'm also one of the, not one of the, I'm the Elder Abuse Project Officer for the St Vincent's Network. 
Thank you so much. And what's the St Vincent's Network? St Vincent's Network is a combination of three particular hospital sites, um, that being St Vincent's Hospital in Darlinghurst, Sacred Heart Health Service in Darlinghurst and St Joseph's in Auburn. Okay, thank you. And, and if you could all speak up just a bit, it, it helps people. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Yvonne Le Pianen. Um, I'm a lawyer at Justice Connect, working in partnership with these two wonderful people. And what's Justice Connect for the uninitiated? Uh, Justice Connect is a community legal centre uh, based here in Sydney and also in Melbourne. Um, we work across a range of different programs and one of those is um, with a seniors law focus. Okay, thank you. And if I could just wiggle over here, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Gillian Freeman. I'm a social worker working in aged care psychiatry at St Joseph's Hospital. Okay, thank you. Oh, that's so good. Now, everyone stay close. So, you're an example of health and justice working together uh, to assist people. So, who can give me an... Ex let, let's go... Let's have three examples. Let's go straight to examples of how you've worked with an individual and or their family to achieve a decent outcome, improve their quality of life in relation to health and law. Do you want to go first? Uh, sure. I, I never let go. <laughs> <laughs> I did in 67. You've got to learn from your mistakes. <laughs> um, well, uh, sure. So just last week, um, I assisted a patient at St Vincent's in uh, one of the acute wards. Um, she had been identified by one of the social workers there um, as having some issues with a, a son with some probably undiagnosed mental health issues. Um, he was able to offer her um, the assistance of a free lawyer. Um, I think that the, the kind of the benefit of this model is that we're, we're really reaching um, older people in the community who are vulnerable to abuse, who uh, mightn't otherwise um, see or access a lawyer, but for the fact that they're encountering one in a hospital. Um, yeah, so I was able to come up and over a number of sessions by her bedside, um, get a, a feel for what the issues were with the son um, and ultimately um, identify she needed some assistance with some substitute decision-making arrangements being put in place and um, helped her with that and, yeah, left her feeling a lot calmer. She said, I feel much more settled now. So, look, I, I don't think it's necessarily resolved all her problems, but it's a step in the right direction. Do you want to comment? You said, do you know about that case? I can tell because you're involuntarily vocalising. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, a social worker. Yeah. <laughs> but no, tell me, you, can you tell us more about that particular matter? I'm going straight to an example, not conceptual, so we get a sense of what it means in practice. Look, unfortunately, I wasn't the direct social worker who was involved, but my understanding was this lady was really struggling between the decision of being loyal to the family member, being loyal to the son, thinking that, look, he's important person in my life is the only family that I have really of that direct network and being torn between what role do I give him whilst also being the recipient of all of this abuse and I think that it's a common thing that we hear as social workers well they're my son they're my daughter they're my family of course if they say they need to manage all my finances of course I'm going to let that happen so I think the beauty of this particular model not only do we have the health perspective as well as the legal perspective but being able to build that trust with that client over a series of interventions at a time that suits her as well. She understood that it's not just family, because I think that we all, I think also for health as well, we do jump to, all right, who are the family involved, without realising that sometimes families aren't necessarily equipped or in the best position to be those substitute decision makers. So that's why I'm nodding in that... I think that um, because what happened in this particular intervention, if I may say, is that besides um, uh, not getting the son to be um, appointed as a power of attorney, I think the client herself was thinking, well, maybe I can just appease him and just let him be my guardian instead of help me with lifestyle decisions. And there's already been a couple of examples to indicate that he's not in the best of situations to be that advocate for her. And being empowered to say, look, who else in your family is out there? And I think... Let, Sorry. Supporting her to think outside that particular box, she was able to identify her sister, who was her, who was then appointed as a power attorney, and then her sister-in-law, right, as her guardian. And something that she didn't really think about. And I think that for us, it's a good reminder that we need to think beyond that nuclear sphere and look at other alternatives. For someone who wasn't directly involved, I felt that was a pretty good briefing. <laughs> Did you feel that? 
Yeah. Um, so now let me ask you that question, what is the model? When you're explaining to someone, someone says to you in a bar, what do you do? And you want to explain the model. I'll, I'll ask each, each of you to explain what is it that you do in the justice health space? So what is it? What it is, um, like Tessa mentioned as well, from a health, health justice partnership point of view, it is very much co-locating and embedding a lawyer into the healthcare team. So we see Yvonne very much as an extension of the multidisciplinary model as well. So rather than just thinking medical, nursing, OT, physio, et cetera, social work, of course, um, that at least we can then say we have a lawyer as part of our toolkit to address any particular concerns and with, this, with respect to this particular partnership in addressing or preventing elder abuse. How would you describe it? Um, what she said. Um, <laughs> and who pays you? Um, well, so far the funding that we've received is from the Department of Family and Community Services through the Livable Communities Grants Program. And we also receive some funding um, from philanthropy. Um, Equity Trustees funds us. And so... You know, obviously today is about sharing examples, but it's also about saying, what do we need to do going forward when we know we have a significant demographic shift about to happen? So from your experience so far, what would be one or two key lessons that you've learned? Um, well, certainly um, the, uh, the, the nature of the health service makes a difference um, in, in, how, in, in the lawyer's role and how they work with the team. So at St Joseph's, for example, um, that's a small subacute hospital in the suburbs. Um, so the benefits of that is that um, I'm very visible and it hasn't taken so, such a long time to kind of gain a profile within the hospital and get to know all the staff. Um, because this, I mean, this model really relies on relationships being developed between the lawyer and health staff. Um, the downside, the downside. Well, it's not really a downside, but it's a smaller pool because it's a small hospital. In an acute setting, um, obviously uh, a much, much larger pool of potential clients, but it's just taken so much longer to really um, get myself known. Um, I still, I've been there for nine months now and I still regularly encounter people who've never heard of a lawyer in the hospital. Um, so I don't have the same visibility and I think um, the nature of the acute setting as well means that um, a lot of the staff are under pressure to, uh, to get patients out the door and they don't necessarily have the time to develop the rapport with them that they might need to, um, to identify these kinds of issues. Thank you so much. Let me come to you. From your experience, what would be the messages you would be giving a, 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 a huge staff meeting at the St Vincent's main campus in Darlinghurst where you've got all allied health nursing and God help us, even some doctors have managed to make it into the room. What are you going to say to them to convince them that it's, they can trust and refer to the lawyer because she'll be useful to their patient. So what, what's the benefit for people of this, I guess? And how would you convince health staff to take it seriously? Um, I think from the examples that we've heard, really having that evidence there that it's something that does work and can work and can benefit our staff um, and the patients as well. I think um, one of the key messages we've also wanted to deliver is that it's a shared responsibility. It's not a social work issue. It's not a hospital issue. It's not just a lawyer issue. Um, it's, it's something that we can all contribute to. So um, I think changing that, you know, addressing that culture change to help, um, to help older people and bring, bringing other staff on board to get engaged. Because it strikes me that... Uh one obvious health justice link, apart from the prevention of abuse, is just access to funds. So if someone wants to stay home and not going to a nursing home, spending their money on a physio visiting or home care visiting or podiatry uh, rather than on money to a child could be the difference between the person continuing to live happily at home or needing care. Is that, am I, do you see what I'm trying, I'm trying to make it nitty gritty. What does, what does law really mean? Does it mean protection of money, use for the patient's own needs and not the family needs? What? I think it's accessibility. Um, and I'm just thinking about an example between Yvonne and uh, myself as well. So I work in the community um, and my client's wife, her first comments were, look, Barb, can you go through all of this legal paperwork? Because all it is is legal mumbo jumbo. I have no idea what this documentation is. And if I were to think, if Yvonne wasn't around, who would I actually call? And who would I feel comfortable to have those kind of conversations as well? Because as a social worker, 
yes, I can say I can be a little bit confident when I speak to services or service providers, etc. But the fact that I already have a relationship with Yvonne, I know that there's no silly questions for Yvonne as well. I was then able to reassure my client's wife and say, look, I do know someone who will be more than receptive and open and provide this legal support. And also the other very, I guess from an accessibility point of view as well, is Yvonne's service to our patients is free as well. So at least the initial, at the very least, the advice stage of Yvonne's service is free. And as a social worker, that's the first thing that a lot of our clients actually mention is how much is that going to cost? So when you are thinking about finances for mait maintaining their well-being at home or their services at home or other things like they want to go shopping for other personal things. Um, so the fact that you can actually provide not only a community-based service but also a legal service free of charge is also you know, one of the outstanding model, uh, items of this particular model. Thank you. Does anyone want to ask a question or make a comment? <coughs> Hand up if you're hearing about this for the first time, just out of interest. So only a few, a lot of you do know about it. Any question or comment on what you've heard so far? <laughs> Who'd like to ask a question? Thank you. Do you want to come out the front? Because I wanted to talk to you anyway. Do you want to come too, Julia? Do you mind sitting down for a sec? Hi. I'm just getting another bit of paper. Do you want to stand beside me? Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name's Teresa Flavin. Um, I was diagnosed with younger onset dementia probably I think it's around seven years ago now, and I'm here with my daughter Maeve and Julia from Hammond Care. Welcome to both uh, your daughter Maeve and also to Julia. And uh, you, you wanted to raise a number of issues, and so can I just ask you about those, or is there something you wanted to say first of all? Well, I think I just wanted to make a few short comments about dementia for me personally and vulnerability. Um, I think the first point I'd make is we talked a bit about ageism here and I'm sure you'll all be aware there's a bit of dementiaism. I don't know if that's a word, um, going around the traps as well. For me, I've noticed it and it comes immediately when you meet a person and they become aware that you have dementia. The first question they'll ask you is, when were you diagnosed or how long have you had it? For me, what I would say is that question in itself is someone, and you can see the little mind turning, they're putting you on a scale of where is she at in the dementia journey. In that judgment, in that split second, that person will judge whether you're worthy of continuing the conversation. They'll judge you for vulnerability, what they can get out of you. They might judge you as childlike and in need of care, but at no point will they think, oh, that's another, just another person. So number one step in helping us with vulnerability is understanding that vulnerability begins for someone with dementia the minute that question is asked. And it's a real trigger for me because everyone asks it. Everyone thinks it's okay. Guys, it's not. It's okay. Um, the next thing I'm going to move on to is um, supported decision making when you're vulnerable. Now, I've spoken about where you are on the scale of wh whether you're worthy, whether you're vulnerable. What I need as someone who is vulnerable is help to make decisions in this legal healthcare area. I don't want the decisions made for me. I don't want them made without me. I want them to be made with me. My family are all into this, we're all on board. But that does not seem to be a thing out there. It's not universal. A lot of people don't even know about the concept. A lot of people think that they're doing great things by doing substitute. Oh, I'll help you out, I'll do that for you, mum that actually makes us withdraw, it'll make our trajectory of disease just go that bit quicker because we stop trying. Can 
Can I just ask you, has anybody done it well? Can you give us an example where you feel someone assisted you to make a decision and you can describe how it's done well? I can. I can talk about... Um, I'll talk about how... I was vulnerable and got ripped off and didn't ask for supported decision making because supported decision making, everyone wants to do it, but no one wants to be supported. I like to make my own decisions. So when it comes to me making a financial decision or a decision that affects the whole family, for me to go and seek the support, it actually, and I know all about this, I've been on the study, I've done the research, I did not accept the support. So what I'd say is it's a two-way street. You've got to teach people to support people. You've got to teach us dementia folk that supported decision making is okay. It's not a sign of weakness. So what happened, I got myself into some trouble. I um, got some free sand from Gumtree. I didn't consult with my charming husband. The sand arrived and it wasn't sand. It was dirty fill, rocks, rubble, blah, 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 the council were there, it was all hullabaloo, it was awful. So, my, again, charming husband, knight in shining armour, he bailed me out, God love him, and I had the stuff all taken away, so he did that for me, and that was beautiful, and I appreciated it. So, when he did that, he actually sat down and said, what were you trying to do, Teresa? I'm trying to build a horse arena, but I don't want to spend a lot of money. He sat with me and helped me plan out how we could do it, how we could pay for it. So he took an hour just communicating with me, not telling me what, but asking me what, and helping me to decide how we can do this together. That's how it should be done. That's how I should have done it, but didn't. So when I talk about supported decision-making, it's two-way street, but we've all got to be on board. Just because I've got to manage the time, can you tell me about the Living at Home program, what that is and why you think it's important? I can. When I was diagnosed, um, I'm sure this is the same for almost everyone out there. When you're diagnosed with dementia, you're sort of sent off, get your affairs in order, you know, and pack up your kit bag and that sort of thing. Um, Recently, I became aware of this living at home program that Hammond Care used to run. And what it was, was um, a residential five-day, I think, course where families would be educated on how to care well for the person with dementia. The person with dementia would also be educated in how to live with dementia. And all of the supports and things that you guys do so well, people and families are made aware of the services that are available. And the research has shown that the costs of care after that program were cut by 50% in five years. And I'd like that, please. <laughs> That's good. And the other thing you wanted to talk about was a, a central point for information. Can you explain that? Um, these days, and interestingly enough, someone mentioned with great pride a knowledge hub. A knowledge hub is the biggest barrier to me, to service. Online is, doesn't help. You may as well tell me I can make my way to Canberra Library. It, it's meaningless. Who's it for? If there's no person to guide me to the Knowledge Hub, if there's no person to guide me to the services, an online hub, no matter how good, is meaningless. It's not real for me. You want a human being. I need a human being. I need a central point who can direct me on how to help myself. And a human being on a telephone or a human being face to face? It has to be face to face for me because what I find is I need to engage all of my senses in order to retain some information. On the telephone, I've only got one sense, so nothing, nothing stays. Would your daughter like to say something or will I leave her alone? I think I'd be leaving her alone. <laughs> I, I know we'll speak to you again, but thank you so much. Thank you. Just before I, I move on to the next segment, would any of you like to comment on some of the issues that Teresa just raised? I could hear some social work vocalisation. Was that you again? 
I like you. I, 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 c- c- come, and, come and stand up beside me. What's going through your brain? I think that one of the things that we hear about a lot is as soon as you speak to services like My Age Care, for example, I'll go to the website, search this up, etc. I'll tell your client to do that. Okay. In an ideal situation, that, you know what, even in an ideal situation, that's not going to work. Because if you're thinking about people who may be um, experiencing or suffering from dementia, but if they are also from a culturally and linguistically diverse background as well, if they've got hearing problems, if they have a mental health issue as well, it doesn't... It, that's why you hear the mm, from me, because it is true. And I think having that reminder, and thank you very much, is that it's good to know that it's not just us as workers who see the insanity of that assumption that everyone should know how to text or to go on the internet and things like that. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit fired up now. Um, uh, anyone like fiery social workers? <laughs> but it is... Well, anyway, as someone who's been down that road, you, you, I... In my home, because my mum has only recently died, there's literally rows of files and they're all different aspects of her care. I turned into a sort of semi-professional navigator. And I've got three university qualifications, but even I have trouble sometimes like coding, locating my aged care number. And you actually resort to pretending you are your mother quite a bit of the time. <laughs> uh, it, just because it's so hard for them to look up the enduring power of attorney and so on. And you'd be amazed the number of people who think I sound 94. Look, I'd love to stay with you all day, but I've got a friend from the United States, so would you give them a warm round of applause, please? Um, And there will be opportunities to hear more examples, but it really is a great uh, privilege and honour now to introduce our keynote speaker who's come an awfully long way, and I always feel like we should thank them for getting on the aeroplane. So our keynote speaker is Assistant Professor Elizabeth Tobin Tyler, Uh, She's Assistant Professor of Family Medicine at the Alpert Medical School and Health Services Policy and Practice Assistant Professor at Brown University School of Public Health. Uh, Her research focus is primarily on the role of law and policy in the social determinants of health and interventions that address health disparities. She's also very involved and interested in interprofessional medical and legal education. And her book in 2018, Essentials of Health Justice, Structural and Legal Determinants of Health. Can you see why she is the perfect person to get on an aeroplane to come here? So please make her welcome, Elizabeth Tobin Tyler. I noticed that I have my own microphone, so I have a lot of power apparently here today. (laughs) Um, It is such a pleasure to be here. I uh, have been to Australia twice before, both times um, to work with those of you that that are working on health justice partnerships, and first in 2012, a little more. Uh, First in 2012, as the health justice partnership movement was really getting started, so it's wonderful to see the progression of the work in Australia and to hear especially examples like the one from St. Vincent's and Justice Connect um, and to hear practitioners talking about the, the real benefit of this kind of collaboration. So it's, it's, it's really terrific to see that progression. Um, I have been working in what we call medical legal partnerships in, in the United States for more than 20 years. Um, but many, like you, many of us have been sort of watching and thinking about Uh, the demographic changes of our population and really thinking about the the critical importance of collaboration across professions to work with older populations and how to do that in in the most effective way. Uh, So the timing is actually quite nice. I uh, just authored a report for the National Center for Medical Legal Partnership um, looking at specific models of partnerships to work with older populations. So I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, some of that work. Let's find my arrow keys here. I'll try this instead. Okay. Um, So I thought I would start first with a story um, because I think as we've already noted, having a sense of how these systems do and do not work on behalf of older adults can really help us think about where we need to go. Um, So I want you to meet Joan. So Joan is 79 years old. She lives in a rental apartment in Boston. While her apartment is pretty run down, um, it has issues with uh, mold, it has issues with broken windows, pretty run down. 
Um, she still likes where she lives because she knows people in her building. It's also close to her church, and she's able to see friends at church on a regular basis, and she finds a lot of comfort there. Joan has one son who lives nearby. Joan, like nearly one in six older adults in America, lives in poverty. In fact, like Joan, half of all women over the age of 65 live below 200% of the supplemental poverty level. Her only income is her Social Security check, which gives her about $1,100 a month, about uh, $1,500 in Australian dollars. Joan, like other low-income older adults, is in very poor health. She has multiple chronic diseases, including diabetes, asthma, and heart disease. She takes about eight prescription medications with different instructions. Some are once a day, some are twice a day. Recently, Joan has developed diabetic neuropathy, which has made it too painful for her to walk. At the end of the month, Joan often runs short on food, so she eats less often and also relies on packaged foods, which are very high in salt and sugar, because they're cheaper. Joan is also what we call in the United States dual eligible, which means she receives her health insurance through two different federal programs, Medicaid and Medicare. Medicare is the program for old, older adults, and Medicaid is a program for low-income older adults, which covers uh, what is not already covered through Medi Medicare. She can barely afford her rent, as her landlord has raised her rent twice in the past four years. Recently, she's had some problems remembering actually to pay her rent and, and her utility bills on time. She just received notice from the electric company that her electricity bill will be shut off if payment isn't received. Her son wants her to give him power of attorney so he can pay, for her, pay her bills for her, but Joan is reluctant. When she sees her son, which is not very often, he screams at her and tells her that she's dumb and that maybe it's time to put her in a home. Her doctor ordered a wheelchair for Joan uh, because of her neuropathy, but when she tried to get it, Medicare said that Medicaid should pay for it, and Medicaid said that Medicare should pay for it. She gave up because she doesn't want to bother her doctor with this again. Until recently, Joan was able to take the bus to her doctor's office, but with her neuropathy, she's not able to walk to the bus. Like nearly two-thirds of Americans, Joan does not have an advanced care plan directive or has done no advanced planning. Nobody's ever asked her her wishes for her health care um, or what she would like if she ever becomes incapacitated. I'm guessing some of you in the room are probably thinking this sounds familiar. <laughs> um, so how do we think about this? First of all, what are the systemic drivers that make it so difficult for people like Joan to access the services that she needs and to actually be able to act on what, she, what her wishes are? Um, the services and supports that are meant to promote independence for older people are unduly complex and bureaucratic. In the United States, at least, the payment systems actually favor institutional care over keeping people in their homes. And I understand here in Australia, um, there has been a movement which is happening in the United States towards thinking about better funding and better services to support people in their homes. But right now, we often just put people in, in the nursing care facility um, because that's in some ways easier. Uh, there are skilled workforce shortages in geriatric care and a lack of support for caregivers um, that really put older adults at greater risk for exploitation and for abuse. And then, of course, relevant to what we're talking about today, our health, social, and legal services are very siloed with separate funding sources and missions, very often not thinking about what are our shared goals. Um, and particularly not thinking about how do we work with older adults around what they want, as was, I think, really nicely discussed earlier. And then the, pro the systems that we have are crisis-driven, right? Um, they're, they're responsive to a crisis that pops up. They're not patient-centered, and they're not preventive. So what if we think about where we might actually intervene? And um, I'm a lawyer by training. Uh, I teach in medicine and public health. And so I think of myself as kind of bilingual at this point um, with medicine and, and particularly in public health and law. Um, in, in, in public health, we talk very much about upstream and downstream. And I think it's something that lawyers um, really need to be thinking about in terms of the way that we deliver service to our clients. So if you think about our upstream uh, um, sort of what, what 
our upstream system is. It's an uncoordinated, fragmented um, system of government and social services programs that often don't address the social needs that, and, and health needs that our patients and, and clients have. Um, so what do we do? We often end up at the downstream place of intervention. Um, in Joan's case, that might very well likely be that she is evicted from her home she becomes homeless, or maybe there's intervention and she moves into a long-term care facility, but that's not necessarily what she needs or wants at this point, right? So what if we started earlier? Um, what if we started with recognizing food insecurity and housing problems that are actually exacerbating her chronic diseases? And we, had, we started by addressing some of those issues to actually prevent some of the, the health problems that she's having. Because what we know with health problems, particularly chronic disease, as they escalate, is that then they create a whole cycle of other problems that come after that. What if we actually recognized earlier that she's beginning to show some signs of mild cognitive impairment, but not enough that she may not be able to continue to live at home and, and make her own decisions? But there may be some supports that can be put in place, like supported decision making, um, that could support her staying in her home. What if we actually recognized earlier, earlier that there are some signs that maybe her son is becoming exploitive and abusive, and intervened at that point or earlier to make sure that she um, is able to actually carry out her own wishes and not be exploited by her son? What if we actually asked her questions about her wishes. There's a, there's a novel concept. <laughs> uh, and, and talk to her about her preferences for her health care and what she would like to do should she become incapacitated. And then finally, you know, because we've watched this process unfold, Joan is beginning to have functional limitations that mean that she may not even make it to the doctor anymore, which has been the one, potentially the one place of comfort um, as well as services and resources that we could, we could use as a place of access for Joan. So what if we started thinking about upstream instead of downstream? So I want to point out again, and again, this is a shift in the way that we think about uh, legal services in particular. So we could probably look at um, those issues that I just talked about and say, well, here's a lot of places where a lawyer could come in and be very helpful, right? Um, but what we know from the United States is that most people, or many people who are particularly older adults and particularly low income and more socially vulnerable older adults, um, never make it to a lawyer's office. They don't know how to find it. Um, this may be a little bit hard to see, but what it says is that about 56% of the older adults that were surveyed uh, had legal, at least one civil legal problem. 10% um, of them had six. <laughs> right, so there's, there's significant legal issues that are being unaddressed. Um, for low-income older adults, they only seek legal help in about 19% of those cases. And actually 87% of the problems, again, in this survey found that um, most of the people, the people, 87% of the people did not actually ever access support or legal help. What's also fascinating, I think, about this study is why, right? Why, do, why is it that older adults don't seek legal help? Um, many of them said they had absolutely nowhere to, no sense of where they needed to go. They, probably, they also thought they couldn't afford it. Um, but a lot, a lot of them said that they didn't actually know the problem that they had was a legal problem. Uh, and I think that's where we can really think about powerful intervention is that if we're actually accessing or connecting with people through their healthcare and other types of services where we know we can find them, then we can ask them the questions that we need to ask to identify those legal issues early um, and actually support them. So let's imagine this, this scenario instead of the one that we know is the way that things usually work. So what if instead of having these disparate services expecting Joan uh, to find her way to different kinds of services. And, and I thought it was really helpful to hear um, the example of the internet sort of being the way that people should access services or know about services. That's actually not likely to be very helpful to many vulnerable populations, but particularly older adult populations. So what if instead we had a healthcare team that on a, in a regular, uh, on a regular basis was asking Joan about her social and legal needs. And what if that, that healthcare team actually had a connection, a collaborative relationship with multiple other professionals in Joan's life that could be supportive of her? 
So that, that team could include a social worker, and we just heard you know, the incredible value of social workers, excuse me, in terms of helping people to access the services that they need, but also identifying potentially um, where other services that they may not be able to help with can be accessed. In the United States, we focus a lot now on this idea of the care coordinator in healthcare because our healthcare system is so incredibly complex to navigate. And so what if we had a care coordinator who was helping the healthcare team make sure that Joan actually makes it to her appointments? Does she have transportation? What are the limitations of that? Um, is she, if she's being sent to specialty appointments, is she making those appointments? Um, I had a medical student actually who, was, who just did a, a recent um, study looking at particularly low income population uh, populations of patients and how often they make it to specialty appointments. And it was astonishing how few of them do. And so he's looking at the systems barriers and the reasons that that happens. And then you can imagine for someone like Joan who has mobility issues, who may have low health literacy, you know, who is really struggling just to, to manage, that could be a real barrier for her. And then of course, what if we had a home services provider who was spending time with Joan in her home, assessing what she needs, assessing her apartment situation, which it sounds like is not, a, not particularly good, um, may in fact be violating the housing code in terms of having broken windows and mold and other things that are affecting Joan's health. Um, and, that, and also thinking about her nutrition, is she accessing the services she needs there? Is her home safe? Is, is it accessible? What are the things we could actually do to create an environment where Joan could, could um, be independent? And then finally, what if we had a lawyer on the team, as we just heard so nicely, can be critical to, to thinking about how we address these systems barriers that sometimes it's very difficult for the other team members to address. So that lawyer could actually work with the healthcare team to do a comprehensive legal needs checkup with Joan. So identifying whether she's, had, she's done any advanced planning, what are the issues? Is she concerned about exploitation and abuse from her son? Uh, are there issues with her landlord violating the law with regard to the, to the kind of um, conditions of her apartment? All of those questions could be part of a regular checkup, just like we think about in health. So think about this. This is not just that we have different people doing different, playing different roles in, in uh, Joan's life, but they're actually talking to each other, right? So the social worker may rely, as we heard just a moment ago, on the lawyer to be able to be supporting Joan through some of these legal barriers. The home services provider is seeing the conditions in Joan's home and reporting those back to the team. So they understand both the health impact of, of that, but also, um, thinking about other services that are going to support her in her home and make it safe. So now I want to just give you some examples from the United States, and again, this is from my recent report that uh, focuses on medical legal partnerships that are addressing the needs of older adults. Um, and they're really actually quite interesting in that they're very, three different, very, three very different models um, of collaborative practice. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is in San Francisco, and this is a partnership that's been in existence for about six years. Um, and this is a pretty robust partnership between uh, the University of San Francisco Medical Center and multiple clinical sites that are involved there uh, with UC Hastings College of Law. And what this program does is it not only coordinates services like you've heard about in the health justice partnership movement um, to support people with their legal needs as part of their health care. Um, and that includes things like I just discussed. Uh, they do comprehensive legal needs check checkups with uh, people who are identified through the clinical practice of these different geriatric um, clinics. But they're also, team, they're also training a team of multidisciplinary students um, in thinking about older adults' needs and how to, to, to deliver this kind of collaborative care model. So they do home visits primarily with uh, the people that are identified that need the services. And again, that's because they really see it as important to, to, be where, to go where the, the older adult is uh, to support them. And they actually bring students from pharmacy, law, uh, medicine, and other disciplines as a team, often on these home visits, and they jointly problem solve. 
Um, so again, it's not just referring to the other service because isn't it nice that we have that referral mechanism? It's actually about how do we think about problem solving in this multidisciplinary context. The second partnership I want to talk about is in Boston. Um, it's a partnership between Boston Medical Center, um, which has a program called Elders Living at Home, uh, and Medical Legal Partnership Boston, MLPB. And what this model is designed to do is really focus on the most vulnerable older adults, um, those that have mental health issues that are on the verge of homelessness. And so what they do is they do what they call their uh, model of extreme case management. And again, it's a multidisciplinary team where older adults are, uh, are identified as having significant vulnerability, particularly for homelessness. homelessness. They jointly problem solve um, and with the goal, with a very clear shared goal of keeping those older adults housed, um, and not just housed, but housed in safe, supportive environments. They've had remarkable success. Uh, they've been doing this for about five years, and about close to 95% of the people that they've worked with have remained home, housed. Um, and so, again, this is about uh, team partnership. How do you work together with a shared goal um, and how, do you be, how, do, how are you successful in that? The third partnership is in Florida. Um, it's relatively new, and it's uh, brought together um, University of Florida Shands Hospital uh, with three, three River Legal Services, which is a legal aid organization. Um, and this, this one is really focused on supporting long-term care options for older adults. And so uh, the attorneys work very closely with social workers and discharge planners uh, in the hospital to identify those patients that are, gonna, are in need of support through an incredibly complex and bureaucratic long-term care system. And what's been really exciting there, too, is that they've, they've really identified some of the systems barriers that have made it very difficult for people to access the care that they, again, want um, and that's appropriate for them. So a few of the lessons learned from these partnerships. Um, this was actually a quote from one of the medical providers that I talked to uh, who is working in California in the Medical Legal Partnership. Healthcare is often a bridge of trust um, and an important site for identification of social vulnerability. So again, if we recognize that many older adults are gonna be seeing their doctor or seeing healthcare providers, it's a wonderful place to build that trust with other kinds of team members. Upstream comprehensive and patient client-centered planning is key to preventing abuse and exploitation and promoting autonomy. So again, thinking about where do we intervene upstream so that we don't come in when the crisis has already occurred. And then I'm an educator, so I focus a lot on thinking about the next generation. Um, as Dr. Reese talked about, you know, how do we, how do we actually train an appropriate workforce in this area. So multidisciplinary training and team-based problem solving um, is gonna lead to more comprehensive solutions that actually reflect ad older adults' priorities. So we need to be thinking about how we're actually training professionals to work in this area because it's a very different way of practice, both the multidisciplinary nature of the practice, but also working with an older ad adult population and understanding those specific needs. So the other thing that I think is really critical about this work, um, and we talk about this a lot with Medical Legal Partnership, is how do we not just focus on the patient or the client, um, which is critically important in terms of helping to, to de develop appropriate solutions for them, but how do we actually think beyond that work and learn from that work to support systems change. So I wanna give you just briefly a couple of examples of how that is happening in the United States based on the medical legal work that's occurring there. So one, which has come out of UCSF and uh, UC Hastings in San Francisco um, with other partners, including the American Bar Association, is thinking about how we can better uh, collaborate between lawyers and healthcare providers when it comes to advanced care planning. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a moment. A second one, and this is from the example in Boston, um, is that often what we find with, with people that are struggling with homelessness or housing issues is uh, as much as we would like to just be able to intervene and make sure that people stay housed, 
Um, often it's a bridge to nowhere. There is no housing <laughs> that's appropriate, right? It's very difficult often to find affordable housing. So um, the MLPB and uh, the, the healthcare providers at Medical Legal Partner, or sorry, at um, Boston Medical Center um, jointly collaboratively work on city advocacy around housing and homelessness together. And you can imagine the power of having physicians in particular, but other healthcare providers, social workers, and lawyers thinking about strategies and advocating for change um, in the local community. So that's very powerful. And then the third example is from Florida, where, um, again, identified through the, the actual patient and client work, um, and this may resonate with you in terms of your own struggles in, in working with bureaucracies, the lawyer, uh, Nancy Wright, who is really wonderful, who's doing this work in Florida, noted um, or, or told me that she, part of what her work it involves is a lot of training of social workers and discharge planners around these incredibly complex regulations uh, around long-term care and people being able to access long-term care. And the discharge planners actually called her one day and said, well, um, we've just been told by the State Office of Elder Affairs that we can't do assessments for home-based home services while somebody is inpatient. The only way we can do that is after they've left the hospital. And Nancy said, that doesn't seem right. <laughs> that seems crazy. So she read the regulations. She got in touch with the Office of Elder Affairs. And they said, no, in fact, that's not true. But somebody in, in the office had suggested this to the discharge planners at the hospital. So you know, having a lawyer who can actually collaborate with the healthcare team when they run into these kind of bureaucratic problems can be very powerful. And Nancy was able to advocate and get that, that um, changed in a way that, that supported the discharge planner's work. So I think as we think about this work, how do we identify those systems barriers that often are quite silly, but they stand in the way of really good care for our patients and clients? So I wanted to say a few more words about the advanced care planning um, collaboration. This is really recent work. Uh, there was a meeting in Washington, D.C. back in October that brought together really half and half healthcare providers and lawyers to talk about how we can better collaborate around advanced care planning. Um, and I'm just going to read the goal because I think it's very po uh, powerful. So the goal was to establish usable, actionable, best practice guidelines to enable both lawyers and clinicians to promote and support advanced care planning in a more congruent and collaborative way in order to ensure that patients' goals of care and wishes are known and clearly honored. Um, it was a fascinating meeting. It was very clear that the two disciplines come at this very differently. Um, sometimes there was arguing in the room about whose fault it was that we don't do a better job of conveying um, or, or uh, sending advanced care directives to medical providers. That many of those directives that are written by lawyers are actually not very helpful when the time comes for medical providers to interpret what needs to be done. Um, that there's very little discussion about how we need to inform surrogate decision makers about their role. Uh, so I think this is a really good example of thinking, again, more upstream and more systemically about the importance of collaboration and the importance of working together. And what came out of this is, uh, is a toolkit and guide for lawyers about how to work, sp work directly with providers um, and, and providers to think about how to work directly with lawyers and communicate and collaborate together on this process. So I wanted to end with uh, just a few takeaways, and these are, again, in the report. Um, so if you're interested, please feel free to, I'll, I'll send you, I'll put up a link in a minute. You can access it. Um, this was really taken from my discussions with people in the field and medical legal partnership that are working with older adults. Uh, promote autonomy and self-determination through a, a person-centered approach to legal, social, and health care. That sounds pretty obvious and pretty basic, um, but if you think about it, it requires a lot of uh, shared planning among professionals. Um, it requires listening to the older adult about what their wants and needs are. Um, and so, you know, often we get so siloed in our own uh, sort of uh, professional 
um, expectation about what it is we're trying to accomplish that either we're overlooking what the older adult actually wants or we're not asking, um, or we're not talking to our professional partners about how we can work together to accomplish those goals. This one was interesting to me because it wasn't something I had thought about, um, but one of the suggestions was that we focus on medical age, not legal age. And this came out per particularly from the work in Boston around homeless older adults. Um, and again, I'm using the, word, the words older adults, but many of these ad adults are in their 50s. Um, but what we know from the research is that people who are homeless, people who have experienced significant trauma, people who have mental illness, they, are, they actually age faster. Um, and so if you think about supporting people in the aging process as opposed to the magic number of 65, um, you should really be thinking about those more socially vulnerable adults and how we intervene again more upstream to support their needs. Uh, screen for unmet social and legal needs early. So again, this is about where do we, where do we um, ask the questions and when, and how can we do that earlier? And as I have said, uh, healthcare is an excellent place to do that because we often are able to access people there. Um, but this is, gives us the opportunity to identify um, early cognitive impairment. It helps us to identify all kinds of social needs and particularly the possibility of exploitation and abuse before it becomes uh, severe. Incorporate a legal health checkup um, along those same lines. You know, if we're partnering together, and particularly through healthcare and law, that gives us an opportunity to do upstream screening, but then through the referral process to really identify the legal needs and legal issues that an older adult is unlikely or often unlikely to identify themselves and realize that they need legal help for. Recognize functional limitations and other barriers um, so that we can actually access older adults where they are. And uh, the, the folks in California have what they call a mobile legal office. And they, um, they take their team and they go to older adults' homes and that's where they talk to the older adult um, because it's, it may be very difficult even in the healthcare setting to be able to have a sit down conversation with an older adult in the amount of time that's required. So, so really thinking about where people are. Support the development of, of the elder care workforce. And this is something I feel very strongly about as an educator, particularly an educator who works across disciplines. Um, we, and I, and I wanna come back to the issue of, of ageism. Um, you know, I know from my own experience that we don't have a lot of people moving into a workforce that's focused on older adults' needs. And I think part of that is ageism. Um, and so I think teaching uh, the next generation of lawyers, social workers, um, physicians, nurses, and others to think about these issues um, and also how to think about problem solving across disciplines is critically important. So it requires a different kind of training for our professionals with a focus on, on a very vulnerable population. So this is the report. Um, I put the website up and I know it will be available through Health Justice Australia if you're interested in that. And I will leave us there. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much uh, for that excellent presentation. Questions or comments, guys, just wave and I'll hurtle towards you. Very interesting, thank you. If, uh, uh, could we have the slide back with the yes. report on it? We all want to stare at it and take pictures of it. <laughs> Any questions or comments, please? I'm trying. Thank you very much. Do you want to just introduce yourself? Of course. Uh, I'm Yvette Gonzalez. I'm from Atticus in Canberra. Just explain what that is. Atticus? Yeah. It's very long. It's AC, it stands for ACT, Disability Aged Carer Advocacy Service. So we are advocates, mm -hmm. mostly. Uh, I am with the project uh, team, and um, our project is about uh, supported decision making. But my question was about uh, the uh, importance of multidisciplinary uh, work, uh, um, ethics, and so... In here, in, in, in Canberra, we were starting to talk about interdisciplinary practice, where social workers are trained 
um, I'm a social worker, so um, we're training other disciplines as well in, in order to, I guess that because we don't have the enough resources or the teams are too small, so a person is training various, um, you know, uh, disciplines really. Mm -hmm. uh, not expert, uh, but just train. Is that you're talking as well over there in the... Um, at, in America? <laughs> yes, I think it's a great question. And so a lot of focus of medical legal partnerships is on training um, and training the, the, the various partners, whether they're social workers, physicians, nurses, um, lawyers training them about some of these legal issues and legal barriers that they're likely to see for their patients and clients, um, but also cross-disciplinary um, training and I talk, I sort of, you know, I sort of joke about being bilingual in medicine and law, but but you know, part of the issue with this is that we don't understand each other's disciplines particularly well, and so we really need to spend time together, both training each other on how the systems work from our perspective, um, but also the the barriers that we see for our clients and patients, and so I think that kind of. Uh, Cross-disciplinary training is critically important. It also supports, particularly in health justice partnerships. I think it was mentioned that you know sometimes people don't know the lawyer is there, um, but if you can if you can build some multidisciplinary conversations in in your team um, through you know training or through just uh, meetings where people come together, we call them huddles in U.S. healthcare, where you get the team together and you talk about particular. Um, patients or clients' needs, or just larger issues that you're seeing at the systemic level, it's very powerful for getting the team to really think about how they function together. Does that answer your question? Okay. Another question or comment? Thank you. And if you could just say who you are and where you're from, thanks. Carol Ferguson from the um, Seniors' Rights Service. Thanks very much for your lovely presentation. Um, one of the things in, in Australia, we always look at America and go, oh, it's a disaster in terms of its medical um, arrangements. And, and one would think particularly so for vulnerable human beings. Um, we also have here the tyranny of distance. And so once you're out of Sydney or Canberra or Newcastle, it's extremely difficult sometimes to access services. To what extent are you able then to translate what you're doing in the big cities, such as Boston and, and Los Angeles, to Ohio or Boise, Boise, Ohio, or Idaho or wherever, so that those people actually can have the benefit of those services as well? Again, very good question. So um, I think with our medical legal partnership movement, uh, we started predominantly in very urban environments um, and particularly with larger hospital systems. And now, as we're now at about 360 partnerships across the US, um, many of which have mo are in rural areas. And so the partnerships look very different. Um, they're often with a very small community health center, um, and a lawyer who may be traveling um, to different places because it, that's what's required with rural um, settings. But, but you're absolutely right that uh, there are different needs, there are different access issues that, that come into play with rural settings. And so creativity is really in important in thinking about how you can build this, this kind of model um, in those settings. And, and, you know, we have, I was visiting one actually in Canvas, Kansas, where um, where we had a lawyer that was, you know, was having to do a lot of driving to different health clinics, um, but she, you know, she could be there and be supportive of the staff and also meet with clients at different times um, to, in order to try to really serve the needs of those populations. Got a, a question here. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Alison Verhoeven from the Australian Healthcare and Hospitals Association. I'm really interested in your model being focused on hospitals because when I look at the type of activity in hospitals in Australia, the average length of stay in a hospital is 2.7 days in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, people visit on average their GP six times per year mm -hmm. and each visit is less than 20 minutes. So these are very time poor interactions for people, both from the, the the person's perspective, but also from the service provider's perspective. So I can see more opportunity in community health centre type arrangements mm -hmm. for um, that more interactive type relationship that you're talking about here. What sort of feedback do you get from the clinicians and, and your legal partners in the US in busy hospitals? Yeah, well, first of all, I, wanna, I just want to um, say that most 
we do have a number of partnerships that are in hospitals, but we've, we also have, I don't know the exact numbers, but at least a third to, to even maybe a little bit more than a third in community health centers um, and other clinical practices that are primarily primary care. Um, so we started, we started a lot of these partnerships in hospitals, but we've really expanded out to other clinical settings. Um, so, and I think, I think your point is really important, which is you this is a point of contact. Um, and so you want an ongoing relationship. Uh, you don't necessarily want to be in an acute setting where you're not less likely to be able to develop that. Um, to the point of the 20 minute visit, ours are 15 minute visits <laughs> with primary care. Um, so what we've learned is that, again, this is the importance of teams. Uh, we can't expect physicians in particular to do a full screening um, with a patient on social needs because they just frankly don't have time. But what we've developed are relationships again with social workers, uh, with physician assistants or medical assistants who work in a team setting with those clinicians or nurses um, who can often uh, ask the questions. I think it's critically important for the clinician, particularly the physician, to see the answers because it actually changes the way that they may um, direct care to that patient. But then again, if there's team communication, then other people on the team are the ones that can support that patient in accessing what they need. So connecting with the lawyer, connecting with the social worker, et cetera. Um, so, so we're very cognizant of not saying to doctors, this is all on you, <laughs> um, but really trying to think about how we build a team that can facilitate that work. Look, thank you so much. We're going to take a short break, but uh, uh, Elizabeth Tobin Tyler will be back with us in the panel session immediately after the break. Would you give her a warm round of applause, please? <laughs>